Oh, come on, let's give Jesus a big hand. Yeah. It's so good. Look how good looking you all are. The water must be good up here in Brisbane. Well, why don't you grab your seats? It's an honour to be here. And uh, thank you for coming out tonight. You know, uh, what, a, what a day we've had in Australia. Wow. I don't have to say anything about it. Just amazing day. Incredible. Um, I just want to uh, couple, say a couple of things and then I'll get into the Word. It's great to see uh, Pastor Mark said, can you make sure you introduce Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul Geeling actually um, is a pastor in this city doing an amazing job at IC Church. Uh, I discovered him as a 17-year-old in Bible College in Adelaide. And him and Mark used to live together. And I could tell you a whole heap of stories about, about their... Who would like to hear a story about that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who would like to hear the story about the time Mark flooded his room? (laughs) Because he had a water bed and he forgot to turn the water off as he was filling it up. And he started seeing water come under the... He believed in rivers from heaven. Um, (laughs) So it's great. It's great to see my dad, obviously, and Del, and my uncle and auntie, Uncle Fred and Auntie Betty. Great to see you. Uh, And, uh, you know, when, when I left... Paradise Church, which was six, uh, 15 years ago, almost 16 years ago now. Um, they, uh, I, said, I remember talking to my brother, and uh, he was he's the pastor there, and um, I said to him, there's two people that you don't want to lose in this church. I said, they're, they're crucial because they love people. And uh, he, he goes, who's that? Someone thought I was going to say someone else. But I said, Mark and Nina Nina Elmendorp are the glue that keep this church pastorally cared for. And one of the great giftings that they have. I've been on staff with Nina uh, for a long time. She was in my wedding, actually. And, um, And they're actually a gift to you. You should appreciate them because of what they carry and who they are. And, um, when they left, when they left Paradise, which is now Influencers, they left a big hole because of what they carried. And the thing I love about them most is they love people. They love people more than most people I know. They'll go the extra mile for people. They will pray for people. They will challenge people. And uh, and I just appreciate them very much. Mark and I um, talk on a regular basis, and we we answer all the world's problems. Um, in fact. We might have appointed the new prime minister today. Um, no, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't. We, we went for Peter Dutton because he's from this area. Just uh, uh, got to um, Holy Spirit come back. Uh, thank you, Amen. Um, but uh, so yeah, I appreciate and love you very much. And seeing what God is doing here is awesome. Awesome. Need to appreciate them all the time. You know, it's a, it's a great joy being a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor of a church. Never wanted to pastor a church, ever. I'm a pastor's kid. I didn't want to pastor a church because I used to see um, the problems that happen. Um, you know, my dad had this person who didn't like them and led a box down the street 40 plus times to our neighbours telling how bad a guy he was, which isn't true, just because they didn't like him. So I thought, I'm never going to pastor a church because that means problems. And God got a hold of me and He said, it doesn't mean problems, it means potential. And what you've got people leading you who see the potential in you. I love this vision. If you, if you don't give this vision, something's wrong. Because if we really believe that we are the answer to the world, then we will give everything we can to be that answer. Amen? Amen. So good. Musos, you can go. Good job. You're from the Philippines, aren't you? I can tell. If I was talking to you in the Philippines, I'd say grub, eh? But, um, which is street word, I know my stuff. And, um, and if I was talking to Philippines, Planet Shaker's biggest following in planet Earth is Philippines. It, I'm telling you, it is by a mile. Um, 
you know, but we, we go everywhere. And uh, I know there's some South Africans here, right? Shoo! Is there any South Africans here? Give me a wave, South Africans, yeah? Wow. There's Zims here? I heard there's some Zims here, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Fantastic. South Africans, um, the, uh, there's a guy who attends our church in Cape Town. Uh, he is actually the leader of the DA. His name is Musi Mamani, and uh, I talk to him regularly about South Africa, and we're believing for a breakthrough in that nation because it needs one in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Any Australians here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mate. We're in Queensland. Yeah. How's it going? Yeah. Go the Broncos. Um, no, go the storm. Come on. Go the cockroaches. No, 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 no. Any New South Welshmen here? Fantastic. The greatest thing about New South Wales is a road to Queensland. Uh, <laughs> and everyone said? <laughs> And, and, and the Queenslanders just feel sorry for you because they've won so many times. Compassion came on, on them. And I could feel that you go, no, we're not like that. We want to smash them. You know, uh, in uh, 1 Kings, <coughs> well, I just used 20 minutes of my sermon um, on introductions. It is great to be here. <coughs> um, I bring you greetings from the greatest city in all of Melbourne, Melbourne in Victoria, um, fastest growing city in Australia. We went 14 years ago, or well, 15 years ago, uh, and started a church. We're not 15 years yet, we're 15 in February, and we started a church, and God has blessed it, and uh, we're amazed at what he is doing in, in that period of time. We are now close to 16,000 people, and we see... Uh, in the last, we're, I was believing for 200 people to get saved every weekend, um, and uh, I was believing for that, and, and God said to me just recently, he said, you've got into cruise mode, and I said, what do you mean cruise mode? He said, 200's easy now. I said, easy now? He said, what do you mean? We pray. He goes, no, 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 I want you to lift your goal to 250. And so three weeks ago, we lifted our goal to 250. In the last two weeks, we've had 239 and 241 people give their life to Jesus publicly. And because um, that's what we're all about, plundering hell and populating heaven. You know, I, I think you should find a church that you get planted in, of course. But our, our motive isn't to transfer the church because we'll never change a city. In fact, we'll just get old and, and die gradually because we just go from church to church. But when you get planted in the house of God and you flourish in that place and you go and reach people, you know, the Bible doesn't talk to us about praying for the harvest. It says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations, Psalm 2, 8. But it, in, in Mark, Mark, I think Mark 9, it says, the, la the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. So pray for the laborers. So the issue is never the harvest, the issue is the laborers. So this church, no problem, no problem if we all went out and showed the love of Jesus to the world and if we all believe that Jesus was coming back and if we all believe that He is the answer to the world and if we all believed that we are His ambassadors to change the world and if we all believe that, that, that He is the only way, the truth and the life and that God's needing a mouthpiece and needing a life to be an outreach to people, you easily, easily could get 50 people saved every weekend at the start, easily. And then go to 100 and then go to... See, I, I love God because He loves taking the one and multiplying it. You ever heard the story of the talents? The five, two and the one talent? Because we're Australians, we like the underdog. And sometimes I used to read that story and I go, the poor one talented guy. God, that's not fair. You give someone else five and then... Then you give them more and you take away the one because he's not doing anything with it. And God says, well, if he did something with it, watch what I'd do. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, well, if they invested their talent, the one talent, it would have become two talents and I would have added to that so it would become four talents. 
And then they get their four talents and they multiply those four talents would become eight talents. And then I would come and add my eight talents and it would become 16 talents. And then they get their 16 talents and multiply the 16 talents and become 32. And then 32 would be added to by 32, it would become 64. And then they get their 64 and multiply the 64, it becomes 128. Then God would add his 128 and become 256. Then you get the 256 and you multiply the 256, it becomes 512. Then God would add his 512 and it would become 1024. And then you get the 1024 and you multiply the 1024, it would become two. 2,048. And then God would add His 2,048 and it would become 4,096. And then you get your 4,096 and you multiply that, it would become 8,182. And then God would add His 8,182 and it would become 16,364. And then you get your 16,364 and you multiply that, it would become 32,728. And then you multiply that 32,728 and it would become become 65,556 through one talent, one talent, one talent. And you keep investing your talents, you change the world. Elijah was in, the children of Israel were in Elijah's time in drought. Elijah had prophesied that it was going to be drought for three years. Well, it, it's, it didn't say three. It says there's going to be drought. It said to Ahab. And the prophets of Israel had been killed. And there was one prophet left. And, and the children of Israel had intermarried with the culture of Baal. And, and, you know, you notice in the Old Testament that people didn't backslide in the hard time. They backslid in the good time. When, they were, when God blessed them, they backslid because they become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. Problem with the Western world, we become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. People say, well, I, I'm a self-made man. No, you're not. God made you. Well, I made this business. No, you didn't. God gave you a brain to, to make decisions to, to make money. He gave you breath to breathe so you can breathe. He just takes your breath. You're no longer made. You're dead. So God is the one who gives us the abilities to do everything we do. And when we lose the perspective of that, and we just say, how blessed are we? We actually go into a season where we're tempted to intermarry with the culture. To take on the behaviours of what the Israelites were never raised to become. And this was the nation of Israel. And Elijah one day got fed, and tired, uh, fed up with it and uh, sick and tired with it. And he decided we, we need to show whose God is real. So they go up to uh, Mount Carmel and he goes to the prophets of Baal. You call out to your God. And so they begin to call out to their God. And, and uh, there they are and they're, and they're screaming to their God. And, and it comes noon time. And this is where I think Elijah may, to, may have been an Australian, maybe a Queensland Australian, because it says about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. Very Australian right there. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a God. Perhaps he's daydreaming or he's relieving himself, or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they shouted louder, followed their customs, and they cut themselves with knives and swords until they bled and gushed out. They raved all afternoon. The first rave party in the earth was right there. All afternoon to the evening sacrifice, but still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Why was there no sound, no reply, no response? Because Baal bailed. <laughs> Baal wasn't real. Baal was something that tried to substitute a real God. You see, your career does not satisfy your reality. You can worship your career, but it will never replace God and what He wants to do in your life because your career will never save you. Only one person will save you and His name is Jesus. 
Your relationships will never save you. Nothing wrong with good relationships, nothing wrong with good careers. But they will never be the substitute for real God. When you're crying out on your sickbed, your money won't save you. Your image won't save you. When my mother was dying of cancer, my skinny jeans and my cool look didn't save her. I needed something more. Needed a God who would come and intervene. And so here, here we see they were calling out to somebody who will never, ever do anything because it wasn't real. It was a fact. There was a, an image of Baal, but Baal wasn't real. It's like people I see over the years who, who'd say, well, I'm just being authentic. And they really say that in response to me challenging them to praise. I'm just being authentic. Just being me. My personality. By the way, who says you got, who puts labels on your personality? You're phlegmatic, you're choleric. I'm, I'm just trying to find that where that says that in the Bible. Oh, I'm going real quiet here. Do not put a label on me. Because you cannot put a label on me because I have Jesus living in me. And there's no label that you can, they try to put labels on Jesus. They try to put lids on Jesus. You see, the real you is the redeemed you. (laughs) So here, uh, uh, it's been an interesting day in Australia. Uh, I could say anything tonight. You never know. I'll just blame the interesting day of Australia. I can't believe what's going on. Um, You know, they go, well, I'm authentic. I, I go, come on, lift your hands. Well, that's, I don't feel like, that's not being me. Come on, shout. Well, that's not being me. I say, which you are we talking about? And they're like, huh? I said, are you talking about your spirit you or your flesh you? So which is the real you? Your flesh you or your spirit you? Your feelings you or your spirit you? Because <laughs> the real you is what you take to heaven. The flesh you is what you leave on earth. So the real you is a worshipping you. The real you is a praising you. The real you is a giving you. The real you is a loving you. That's a real you because you are made in the image of God and you have the Spirit of God living in you. That's the real you. We just got to say to our flesh you, come in line with our spirit. That's why I'm going to clap. That's why I'm going to shout. That's why I'm going to praise. Why? Because that's the real me. My mother used to say, we are here. What are we doing? We're training for reigning. In heaven, they're not sitting back going, well, I'm just being authentic. <laughs> no, they go, holy. It's like people who say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why. You will not. You'll be going, wow, wow, wow. You'll say, wow forward and wow backwards. You'll be like, amazing, incredible. Wow, God is, oh, Wow. Because in worship and when God's touching you, I never hear people go, why? They go, wow. So when you're in heaven, you're like, oh, holy, oh, heaven ain't quiet. You know, the, the devil's trying to quieten the church down. Just be quiet because that's reverent. Reverence is quiet. No, reverence is death. What? Sorry, no, reverence is death. Quiet is death. Dead people don't make noise. You can go, hey, what's up? And they're like, I don't talk back because they're dead. Heaven is the most holy, reverent place and the angels are shouting to one another, holy, holy, holy. Why should the devil get all the sound? You see, everything's created through sound. Devil knows this. God spoke the world into existence. He's, he released a sound. He released a sound to bring things that weren't even in existence to life. He released a sound. You form your world through your words, through a sound. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible says there's life and death in the power of the tongue. Do you know that you are actually sounds? That light is made from sound. Did you know that? Light is made from sound. So... You're a person. You go, gee, you're so smart in Melbourne. You're a person. The word person is a Latin phrase, per, son. 
The word sun is where you get the word, word sonic or sound. Purr is what flows through. So a person is the sounds that flow through their life. Jesus was the personification of the Father. He was the sound of the Father. So we need to release a sound of breakthrough, a sound of victory, a sound of joy, a sound of peace, a sound of love, a sound, you know. People ask me all the time, oh, are you worried about Australia? No. Why not? We voted for this and we voted for We did. I didn't love it, but it's done. Well, what's your response? If we win the whole of Australia to Jesus, those laws will go anyway. (laughs) So the issue isn't getting all worried about stuff. The issue is how many people can we win and show the love of Jesus to and show the way of the kingdom to and show them how Jesus loves them. Not worried. So there they were. No sound. No, he was quiet, quiet, quiet. Because he's not Baal's not there. He bailed. So what did Elijah do? The Bible says he redug the altar. You see, when you pray, you're you're presenting a place of sacrifice. When you praise, you're presenting a place of sacrifice. It's time to redig the altars of prayer in your life. And in our life, we're in it, our church, people say, what, why is it going? Why is it doing what it's doing? Because every, every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., seven, 800 people come out to pray. Every second of the day, someone's praying in the life of our church. When we have our combined night prayer meetings, we would have up to 2,000 people attending, getting a hold of God. Why? Because we're rebuilding the altars of God. You see, I've discovered in the Western church, particularly in the Western church, we've, learned, we've stopped learning how to pray. We watch people pray. I go to prayer meetings sometimes, the person out front, oh God, and people are like, they're observing praying. There's a sound of prayer. If you ask not, you have not. Well, God should know my mind. Well, why does he tell you to speak? With your heart you believe, with your mouth you confess. So you have to declare what you believe to release what you feel and receive. (laughs) So he redug the altars. He put a bull on there, cut it up. It had been drought for three years. What is the most precious thing to drought? What is it? Water. Thank God I'm in Australia. If I asked that in America, it'd be water. I said, what's water? One time I was flying in a plane in America, and I said, what would they like? I said, I have a Diet Coke. They come and gave me a vodka. I'm like, no, no, I don't don't, don't drink. (laughs) Um, That happened three times, actually, on a plane. I said, oh, sorry, you didn't understand me. Um, Can I have a Diet Coke? Oh, wow. Oh, okay. I, I tell my American friends, you don't speak English. It's called English, but you, you think it's American because honor has you in honor, not all. And favor has you in it, so I want favor. Do you want favor? Yes! Or well, get to learn English properly. Amen. Thank you. Amen. But we love Americans. We really do. Water is the most precious thing in drought. See, if you ask me in Australia, 8% of people go to church. If my mum and dad, if I came home from school one day and I said, hey, uh, they go, here's a, here's a school report, and I got 8%, I would have been ministered to. And my father and my mother had a different ministry gift. My, my father had a compassion ministry, and my mother had a truth ministry. My mother was a Queenslander from Nambour. 
She's a farm girl, mate. Yeah. She, she believed in the word. We had scripture everywhere in our house. On the wall. Um, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I knew when I was naughty because I'd get scripture in my room. <laughs> Children, obey your parents. <laughs> Even in the bathroom, we had scripture. Fear not, for I am with thee. That was for us after experience, my brother's experience in the, in the bathroom. We had to say, don't fear anymore. Um, we had a stick in our house which had scripture on it. I've been, oh, I, I, I've worked through myself, but scripture. Spare the rod, spoil the child. On the other side, we need thee every hour. One time I sat away from school for seven days because I felt called to the amusement places. Everyone's talking about winning schools. I'm going, who's going to win the people out there? And my, uh, I'd come home from school and my mum would say, how was school? I said, it was awesome. What did you do? And I thought, well, there was like a pinball machine. So that's like maths adding up. Yeah, maths. Oh, yeah, cool. And. What else you do? And I thought there was like a basketball shooting game. That's PE. We did that, PE. Um, there were a lot of international students in the amusement place. So that was international studies. <laughs> there was a science fiction game. That was science. On the seventh day, I came home and my mother asked me the same thing. And I went through the whole thing. She said, what's this? And showed a letter from the school. I'm like, wow, you're beautiful, mum. Amazing. <laughs> I can see why dad married you. Wow. <laughs> Queensland girl. Yeah. Wow. She said, wait in the bedroom for your father. I'm like, oh no. So I'm doing deals with God. God, I'll be a missionary <laughs> for one week in some place in a three-star hotel. That's as low as I'll go, Lord. <laughs> three-star hotel. And my dad came in with a stick and he starts crying. My dad gets his tears a lot, and he gets a wobbly lip, and, and he, <laughs> it's usually when you talk about Jesus, he gets that, when, and when you talk about poor power, yeah, talk, wobbly lip, because they lose a lot, uh, <laughs> and he gets his stick, and he goes, he starts crying, this is going to hurt me, all that it's going to hurt you, I said, give me the, I said, dad, give me the stick, you bend over, and let's see if that's the case. Parents say some dumb things. Do you want a belting? What's a kid going to say? Yeah, give me one. When my mum, when she got that stick, something would happen. My redeemer lives. Cha, cha, cha. My redeemer lives. Cha, cha. She would go through verse, chorus, second verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, bridge, chorus. I'd go, mum, stop. She goes, no, the glory of the Lord is here. One more time. If I got 8% at school, it'd be called a fail. It'd be called a drought. If you want to look at our nation, it's a great nation, but spiritually it may have some drought issues. So what do you do? You pour on the altar of God what is precious in drought. That's water. What is precious to you? Money. Time. You see, what is precious to you is what you give to God. <laughs> so when we come this weekend, I didn't know this weekend was happening, but I'm pretty happy that it's happening. Because if you pour what's precious to you, your money, because your money represents your time, your hobbies, your, your groceries, your housing, it represents your holidays, it's precious to you. And when you pour it out on the altar of God, and he did it three times. I think we should do three offerings a year like that. Th three times. And what happened? He then stepped back and called fire. And fire came from heaven and the whole nation got on their knees and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he's God. And we think that's the end of the miracle. But no, that's just the beginning of the miracle. Because it says, he says, after they had done this, 
It says in verse 41, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go and get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Rain in the Scripture represents an outpouring of the Spirit. Rain in Scripture represents blessing. Rain in the Scripture represents refreshing. Rain in the Spirit represents a a, a place of cleansing. I'm here to tell you here tonight that I don't see drought, I hear the rain. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I hear the sound of rain. I hear uh, an outpouring of the Spirit of God so you can complain about about the drought. You can whinge about the drought, but it's time to rebuild the altars. It's time to pour out what is precious and begin to start hearing what the Spirit is saying. I hear the sound of rain. And he says, tell Ahab to climb up. He says, tell him to go eat and drink. Now, what does that mean to me? That means tell him to party. Eating and drinking, have a party. You go, well, that's a strange thing to do. See, I believe church should be a party. Church should be the greatest party on the planet. It should be better than the rugby. It should be better than than any movie you see or any concert you see or any 21st or any 50th birthday or any celebration. It should be the greatest party on the earth because where can you go in a place where people are free and they love and they have the same thing in common from different places, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different education. But the one thing that unites us is Jesus and He's the reason that we party. That's why our praise shouldn't be, mm, should get free. So worrying what people think. I remember one time I saw this person and he's in a Pentecostal church. Everyone's lifting their hands and he's like, I want to lift my hands. I said, why don't you? He goes, I'm worried what people think. Think about that logically. Everyone's like, So I said, what did you do? He went. Because the devil's lying to him saying, everyone's looking at you. Then he's like. In the shower, he'd be like. In church. You see, the devil lies. You think about this. We give people an opportunity to come to Jesus which I'll do in a moment, and the devil says, what will people think? Everyone in this room is praying for them, and the devil says, what will people think? In a room that everyone's, oh God, please get them to put their hand up and receive you. And the devil says, what will they think of you? Think how logical that is. (laughs) And so I've discovered with how rain is formed that something must go up from one atmosphere And hit another atmosphere for something to come down. Rain comes out of moisture, comes out of heat and moisture of the earth, which goes up to another atmosphere. The atmospheres collide and they start forming rain droplets, which form clouds and they become so heavy that rain comes down. Something must go up for something to go down. Our praise goes up, His presence comes down. God inhabits the praises of His people. He comes and sits down in the midst. Our prayers go up, miracles come down. Our faith goes up, heaven comes down. Something must go up for something to come down. It says, and Elijah climbed up the top of the mountain. Everyone say, go to the top. You are so nice. He went to the top of the mountain. And the Bible says he, he got his head between his knees and he began to pray. See, churches, I started saying this before. But a church that doesn't pray is a church that says they don't need God. Which actually is saying I am God because I'm relying on me, not Him. Because when I pray, I humble myself. And I say, God, I'm not big enough to answer this. You are almighty. You are big. So I humble myself. I put my dependence upon you. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then they'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. What does it come? It comes by humbling oneself. You know, every church split has come through pride. Why? Because people haven't humbled themselves. Every marriage is broken up because of pride to some degree. Why? 
Because somebody's got proud and they think they don't have to do something for the other person. Might, there might be an innocent party, but somebody in that relationship has says they're bigger than someone else and they'll do whatever they want. Selfish. What does the Bible says? say? He says, God resists the proud. So a Christian that doesn't pray, to me, is a Christian that's proud. And they wonder why God isn't turning up. Oh, oh, sorry. When when things go wrong, then we get humble again. Wouldn't we get be so blessed that we keep humble? Say, God, I'm so blessed. I've got to keep humble before you because I don't want to lose this blessing. <laughs> he prayed. And there's Elijah sitting on his blessed assurance, praying. Says to his servant, Go and have a look for rain. So he, the Bible talks about it was a long, it was a distance. So he went for a run. He looks. Any clouds? No clouds. Whew. Runs back. Elijah has not moved. <laughs> he says, any rain? No, no rain. Go again. Oh. Go again. He goes, has a look. He's running back, and I'm sure he's beginning to think, I hope he doesn't make me go again. <laughs> Gets back. Any rain? No, go again. That's yeah, all right for him. Just sits there and, do, and we do all the work. No rain. Oh, he better not ask me to go back. Whew, well, I'm, I'm getting a bit of an attitude here. Any rain? No, go again. There better be rain or I, I'm leaving the church. No rain. If he asks me to go again, I'm going to find a church that doesn't challenge me to look again, that just gets me to settle down and doesn't want more, which a lot of people do. Go again. By the fifth time, I'm sure he's starting to enjoy his running mornings. You know, I used to work out a lot, and I started running for the first time after many years, and, and the first time I was like, oh my gosh, oh. Second time, I get back and I'm like, oh, that was good, I finished. Second time, I'm like, oh. Third time, I'm getting stronger. Fourth time, I'm getting stronger. Fifth time, I'm enjoying it. See, every time you go looking for your miracle, your faith gets stronger. It doesn't get weaker. It gets stronger because you got up again and you had another look. So many people can give up easy. Well, I didn't see it, so I don't believe anymore. I asked God and he didn't do it how I wanted him to do it. So I'm offended and I'm leaving. God. Oh, I love God, but I hate his church. It's like you inviting me and my wife over for dinner. Love you, Russell. But your wife, she's an old bag. She's ugly. No, that's how people treat God's church. I've discovered when you're so in love with God, you're so in love with what he loves. People. Go again. Oh, I'm enjoying this. I'm, I love that Pastor Mark says, come on, there's more campuses to park. I love that. I love that he says, I'm not, I'm not apologizing to ask you to give more. Why? Because he's heard something. So has Nina. Go again, seventh time. Woo-hoo-hoo! O M G. <laughs> Literally. If it was Old Testament, it would be, which it is. O M Y. O my Yahweh. <laughs> he, he's like, whoa! Starts running back. You imagine. He gets out, he goes there and he's like, hey, Elijah goes, you see anything? Yes! What did you see? I saw a cloud. The size of a man's fist. Now, if you turn on Channel 9 News, today in Queensland, the radar says there's going to be a mighty rainstorm. Because if you can see, right there on the radar, right, you can't really see it. It's sort of like... Uh, and all over 
Australia, it's, there's no clouds, but that little dot, dot, that sort of dot, that's a cloud the size of a man's fist. You'd be liking. They've been smoking something before this episode. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You'd be going, I'm turning off that channel. I'm going to go watch CNN. They don't know that everything must be true there. What does Elijah do? He doesn't go, well, go again, that's too small. He says, he shouted, hurry! Go tell Ahab, climb on your chariot and go back home. Because if you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And as soon as the skies, Mr. Keyboard, come and make me sound anointed for a second. Where is it? It's gone around the back way. It's all right. Hi, how are you? Good. That, that was really sneaky. You, we, we didn't see you moving and come around that way. You, <laughs> you ever seen people walk out of church and they're, they're, or in a meeting and they're, they're in front of people and they're like this? Everyone can see them. Just stand up. Like, could you stop that music for a second just stop do you watch this this is, this is amazing Jesus now could you do that music Jesus <laughs> you got big guns man are you single no, you're not married, children, wow, do you lift them up with one finger, you're like, in worship do you do this, <laughs> sorry, I've gone over time, I know, um, <laughs> how do you know church would be fun, no, I like it boring, He says, run, because I hear a sound of rain coming. And soon the sky was black with clouds and a heavy wind, a heavy wind, a heavy wind, a heavy wind. Acts chapter 2, they're in the upper room and there came a sound like a mighty rushing wind. There's a heavy wind coming to this land. There's a heavy wind which brought a, he a terrific rainstorm. The drought, the drought was broken. The drought was broken. Why? Because a man built an altar. He poured out what was precious. He called down fire, but he climbed higher. See, this church is going so good, but I'm here to tell you there's more. Climb higher. Go stronger. See, there are people in this room and some of you say, well, I've been believing for this, but I ha haven't seen it yet. And my, my message to you is, go again. Look again. Believe again. Each time you look, you get better. There are people in this room and you said, well, what, what I see is a, just a little breakthrough. That family member, that finance, that job. It's a little breakthrough. My word to you today is get ready. Get ready. Because a wind's about to blow and an outpouring's about to happen. By the way, by the way, this church is going great. But in 10 years, you look at this and this will be like a cloud the size of a man's fist. To you right now, it might be an outpouring because every season you look back and you say, that was good, but that's just like a man's fist. See, what happened, what's that happened is this. You put your faith with my faith and we join our hearts and we release an anointing for something to go up for something to come down. 